This is Mole Mama. Take a journey with me to my kitchen where I recreate some of my sweet Mama Rose's best Mexican family recipes. I'll share the stories behind my grandma's magical mocajete, guacamole, crunchy tacos, mole, papas and chorizo chimichangas, kalua cake, crack cake, and oh, so much more. You'll also get to meet guest chefs as they share the stories behind their yummy recipes. I believe that food is the sixth language of love. And if you're like me, it's your love that makes your food magical. Tune into Mole Mama on Thursdays at 6 p.m. for all the fun and love. You might want to eat first because this show is going to make you oh so hungry. Que Dios te bendiga, as my mom would say. May God bless you. Hola and welcome to Mole Mama Cooking with Love. We drive connection, unity, acceptance, and love across all cultures and generations. And I just want to be very clear that all are welcome here and we're delighted that you're listening. And for Mother Teresa, spread love everywhere you go and let no one ever come to you without leaving happier. And based on whose guest our guest is tonight, you're going to leave probably extremely inspired as well as wanting to do a little bit of shopping. Please check out our new podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and please leave us a review and subscribe. Once again, welcome to Molly Mama Cooking with Love. We celebrate home chefs, entrepreneurs, side hustlers, and foodies like my sweet mama Rose and my tia Hubi. We talk about heritage, family recipes, traditional tools, like my grandma Magdalena's magical mocajete. And I remind you every week that the secret ingredient to every great recipe is our love. I want to welcome our returning listeners. I see Carmen, Renee, Terry, and others. Thank you so much for tuning in. And if you're listening for the very first time, we're delighted that you're here. And please check out our YouTube Molly Mama Recipes channel and my some of my mom's yummy recipes like her guacamole and her crunchy tacos and enchiladas and Spanish rice and mole rojo and chimichangas and so much more are there. And they're e- most of them are pretty easy to make. If you have any questions at all, please reach out. And if you do make any of them, please post pictures on Instagram or Facebook. We love to see those. So I am super excited about tonight's guest. We have a very talented young woman. Irena Flores from I'm Head is here. Her work has been featured in print and online publications, including Brides, Martha Stewart Weddings, Brides UK, Destination Weddings, Australian Gourmet Traveler, Echo Beautiful Weddings, Pregnancy and Newborn, and Taste of Home. She also has had her banners in the Cinco de Mayo episode of Food Network's hit TV show, Guiada at Home, and featured in Etsy's new nationally televised commercials. So with that, I would love to welcome this amazing artist to our show. Hello, Irena, and welcome. Hi, Diana. Thank you. So before we be here. It's great to have you here. And before we get started, do you have anybody that you want to say hi to out in Radio Land? Oh, gosh, I don't know. Hi to everybody that's listening. Thank you so much for your support, and um, thank you for following and supporting fellow Latina and artists and entrepreneurs and, you know, just just being there, giving us your ear and and, um, your valuable time. That's great. So, do you want to tell our listeners what fine papel picado is? Um, well, my my growing up experience with papel picado here in um, in the U.S. Southern California specifically was that um, most of it was like mass produced plastic stuff, and um, I had never seen handcrafted like original designs um one when, when i was growing up my my family was always involved in like the local community festivals and events and parades and stuff and so i grew up around papel picado but it just all kind of wasn't very inspiring and then um i guess the idea behind fine papel picado was that i decided to start making my own designs and sort of like trying to make it the most beautiful that I like what I would like to see and so um that's that's where that name came I wanted to bring back like um the option to get something crafted by hand 
Well, your designs are are so beautiful and so colorful. And as I've looked at your Instagram and your website, I can't help help myself but just smiling because they're so joyful. So um, (laughs) I've captured that. So, um, oh, thank you. That makes me really happy. You definitely have, and and I know that we have listeners pretty much all over the U.S. and different parts of the world. And so, just to help everyone understand, it's it's a Mexican cultural thing primarily. But what do what do you cust- your customers buy papel picado for? Their special events that they're buying it for. What do they use it for? Oh, um. Gosh, that's changed a lot over time. We've been doing this for about 10 years. I start, I opened the, the online shop in 2008. And um, <clears throat> in the beginning, um, what was popular was personalized banners for weddings. For example, it would be like the couple's names and their wedding day. Um, and I started out doing it like small batch, handcrafted, um, custom paper colors, uh, at the time, there was nobody else doing it, and so I just wanted to make it available, like, to people who couldn't afford to do it for a huge amount. Like, you know, you could just buy two banners at a time, which we still do today. And then um, the wedding banners took off. Uh, I got a call early on, within the first few months of opening the shop, from um, Martha Stewart Weddings Magazine, and they asked us, they asked me to d- design something exclusive to their magazine that they could feature. And I was like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic. So, yeah. But, um, I was, I was really nervous, you know, I'd never, I was so new to the craft. I was teaching myself and, um, but, um, I designed something that they featured in the magazine and the shop took off from there. And I realized like, okay, I, there's, there's something here. And, um, <clears throat> But, um, yeah, the weddings remain popular, but over, over time, like like I said, we've been doing this for 10 years, so I started to bring more of my personality, more of my values into what I was doing um, as I got more confident in it. So, like, for example, one of the, the breakout designs early on was um, I did a design for single mothers who are having baby showers. I, I said baby mama. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm a single mom. This is before that movie came out and everything. Like back then, it was just like, you know, slang. And um, I'm a single mom, and I grew up, you know, with the negative connotations that were associated with that. And I was like, I wanted to do something for the uh, for the other mamas out there, you know. And so um, that became really popular. That was actually featured in like parent team magazine which surprised me but they were like so supportive and really just like open to other family styles <clears throat> um so yeah we as our bride and grooms that we started out with as customers in the beginning have grown and their families have grown so has the shop like um yeah from from weddings we moved on to um first anniversary gift which uh, the first anniversary is uh, paper. So we would do like custom paper items and then have their kids and they came back for baby showers and they came back for first birthday parties. And yeah, I mean, this last year we we started doing um, graduations and I'm like, wow, you know, these people have really carried our, our little, our, our business, with them through their, their genesis of their family. It's been a really beautiful experience. That's outstanding. I saw the caps that you did for graduation, or I saw a couple of them, and I'm like, those are gorgeous. Okay, so you have had amazing suerte, which is luck. <laughs> really talented, but for Martha Stewart to find you at the very beginning, that's outstanding. So um, what inspired you to even start your business? How did you get going? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, it, it's one of those, those like, um, it, it was born out of necessity. Um, I, I graduated from college with a photography degree during the transition between uh, digital and film media. I was trained in classical film photography and um, 
Kodak and Polaroid went bankrupt the year I graduated. And I was like, what am I going to do? <clears throat> so, um, but I knew I had these photo skills and, and my favorite thing to do is to um, create like uh, product shots and tabletop well-lit setups. So I wanted to do some, I'm very detail oriented, obviously. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I started, I, I've always been a maker of many things. So Etsy was getting, gaining traction at the time. And I opened an Etsy shop and using my photography skills, I took pictures of basically everything I could make. I threw everything against the wall and I was like, what's going to stick? You know, I just need to make some money here. I have a kid to support. This is something's got to work. And I had like a vague idea that I, I wanted to make like a, like a little, like a little marketplace where of earrings and photography, like sort of colorful and beautiful and definitely with the width of the Latina slant. <clears throat> and I had uh, started to make papel picado out of scissors and I had some laying around my studio. And I was like, well, it would be pretty if while you're scrolling past all these other items, I've got papel picado sort of decorating the website page. So I listed it and that was the beginning because it kept selling and it kept selling and I realized like um, I'm onto something here. So at that point I really just sort of cut everything else out of the shop and focused on Papel Picado and I was uh, I had so much fun with it. Just taking pictures of it and like, you know, making uh finding different paper colors and uh, just growing the shop and, and building the brand around it. I, I didn't know anything about branding, but I taught myself about that. And <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's how it started. I mean, I, I really was trying to figure out a way how to use my photography skills in a way that I loved. And it morphed into like a, using all the tools in my tool belt, you know. That's outstanding. Yeah. So you, you basically were almost using it in your photography to highlight other products but that's what people liked the most that's just wonderful how did you manage to teach yourself was there a family member or somebody that taught you or how did you do that um i think that there's a this, there's this book i forget what it's called i think it's a uh, making magic windows by uh carmen Lomas garza and um my mom was a librarian, and so as when I was a kid, she would bring home all kinds of crafty books because that was my favorite thing to do. Like, I learned everything from embroidery to sewing to making doll clothes, and one of the things that she brought home was this book by this artist, Carmen Lomas Garza, and um, she had uh, – gosh, I think that's her name. I hope I'm getting it right. I'll let you know later. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, she, she had, like, a – where she taught really basic puppet picado patterns that you could make with scissors. And so I started there as a little girl and um, making snowflakes. And then I learned how to make some of her patterns. And then um, I spent some time as a graphic designer. And so I've always been like very like graphic oriented as far as design. So when I started teaching myself how to make puppet picado, um, I, I learned that um, the traditional way is to make it with chisels. Like you have many different shapes of chisels and you actually hammer it into paper or stacks of plastic <clears throat> and um, and you follow your pattern. And um, the shape that you're able to create with a chisel depends on how many chisels you're able to make. So I got a hold of as many chisels as I could find and very quickly I realized that, that the designs I was seeing in my head I didn't have enough chisels to be able to create them. So I started to use chisels and like nails and like anything I can get my hand on. It was puncture type of tool. And then that wasn't enough. So then I branched off to teaching myself to use um, an exacto, which was great because then I was free. I could just basically create any shape I wanted and I didn't have to worry about making a chisel for it. And at that point, that's when the shop really started to take off because I got to be as creative as I wanted with the designs and, um, and make them. And, um, yeah, that's kind of like the genesis, like how I, how I ended up doing it. It was just a lot of trial and error. So 
some, you, know, you reach a wall where something's really hard to do and then you figure out a way around it or through it and, you know, whatever you have access to, um, just keep going forward. You are definitely very creative to have developed this and to keep going. And that so, so many of your designs are so remarkable. But before we continue in that, to talk more about that, I have to know where this name came from because it's so fabulous. I'm Ohad. So, <laughs> and, and for our listeners who are non-Latins, can you, can you translate that for everyone first of all? Oh gosh, it's always hard to translate. <laughs> I'm Ohad literally translates to, oh woman. <laughs> but um, uh, the name of the shop came up uh, one night I was having, uh, we're sitting on the dinner table with my family and we're always joking around and teasing each other. And they were, we, I was telling them that I had this idea because the shop was starting to, my website, I started to sell Papel Picado. And I was like, I think I can do this as my job. And they were like, I'm ahead. Come <laughs> on for real. Which, which is basically like, they were telling me like, Oh, you, you are just, you know, be realistic. Come on, you know? but in a loving way. And I was like, no, you guys, I think I can do it. And I'm going to call it I'm ahead. I'm going to show you. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I'm one of those people that always has like the wild idea, like the pie in the sky idea. And people are like, I'm ahead. Come on. And I'm like, no, trust me. If we do this, if we do this, we can make it happen. And, um, anyway, that just, it's fit. And, um, yeah. And then I trademarked it. I realized nobody else had it. So, <laughs> That was kind of clever. It's a very clever name. It's very darling. Yes. Yeah. Over the years, I've heard from other people and they write me and and like a couple of women have said, you know, I I love following your Instagram feed. You're so funny. And I just shake my head and I go, I move ahead. (laughs) Or they'll say that when I make a new design, they look at it and they go, I move ahead. Like in other words, oh my gosh, that's beautiful. So for, I think for different people, it means different things. So I like that about it. That's fantastic. So are you making all of your designs by hand? You know, are you yeah. still using it? And do you ever yeah, turn I, into stencils or 3D printers? or? Um, no, what happened was, um, referencing back to how I learned, um, got to the point where I was cutting everything by hand with exacto and chisel and puncture tools. And um, this was probably about 2011, 2012. And um, I just had too much demand. It was just me at the time. Um, And then I asked my brother, Esteban, who's my little brother, he's a couple years younger than me. And he's also a maker. He's always been very crafty with his hands. And I was like, Esteban, can you help me with the shop? And he learned how to hand cut in the same way that I was doing. And so there for a couple of years, but we got things, things were just like, there was too much for us. So our turnaround time stretched out to like 12 weeks. And that was just, that was too long. I felt like people should get their work sooner and we were losing out on opportunities because we were booked so far ahead. And um, so at that point, I started to look into uh, getting a laser cutter because my previous experience at a graphic designer had been at a, a sign shop. Mm-hmm. And when, when I was working there, I actually developed a carpal tunnel on my wrist. So this whole time I'm developing a big other business, like I'm in pain, but it's, it's what I have to do, you know? And I'm like, I had to do this. This isn't sustainable. It hurts too much to do this by hand all the time. And so um, I looked into getting a laser cutter and um, then we transitioned my hand-drawn design into that. And so like all the lettering or lettering that I have drawn by hand, all the designs or things that I have drawn by hand, I cut something by hand for them from the get-go and then I scan it in and then turn that into a template that we use within our shop. So yeah, it's still very, very handcrafted. It's just, I don't have to worry about icing my hand at the end of the day, you know? And in the beginning, I was like really, really super nervous about doing it that way. Cause I felt like it was sort of 
was inauthentic somehow. And I talked to my customers about it and I offered them different price points. And I was like, if you want to pay more for hand cut and every single time they're like, we don't care how you make it. We just love what you do. And so my, it was my customers and clients that taught me that it's okay to just like as a maker to do what you need to do as long as you're still being authentic, like from your heart. And so, yeah, that's where we're at now. Yeah. Everything's still hand We do a lot of laser cutting. Sometimes we get hand cut commissions in it. Um, either I or still that. Now I thought I saw on your website that your work has, is even in the national museum, Hispanic museum. Is that correct? Oh, that was, that was fun. Um, I got a commission from the National Museum of uh, Mexican Art in Chicago to do, um, they do a Day of the Dead event every year for, with altars. And um, the museum was doing an, an altar um, for breast cancer, uh, breast cancer victims. <clears throat> and they reached out and they asked if I would do um, a hand cut background with a, like a large pink ribbon. And they ended up being, I think like four feet by five and a half feet hand cut, a giant pink ribbon with, you know, details all around it. And the way that they found me was because my grandmother had had um, breast cancer the year before. And I had created banners for her hospital ward where they had other cancer um, patients and, and the nurses had hung them up at the, the, the nurses stations and they said hope and they had pink ribbons. And so I had listed that on my website. And then, and so I guess that that's how they found me again, speaking back to like a lot of the growth in the shop has happened because I brought my life and what I cared about into it, you know? That's <clears> awesome. I, yeah. I saw a picture. It is stunning. So for our listeners, if you go to I'm Ahead's Instagram feed, you can find it. And it's really amazing. I did not know it was that big. That's really, really big. So how long did something like that take you to create? Uh, it probably took me about four days to do the pattern. And um, hand cutting, it, it took me about a week, um, and then uh, and then I had to find. I had to send it. The only way to ship it without it being messed up or folded or anything was to find a giant cardboard roll because I wanted to roll it, you know. And I spent a few days trying to find a roll big enough. <laughs> <laughs> Like I made the thing and then I was like, Oh, how am I going to ship it? Why did I think about this before? But you know, it's just trial and error. You're learning. <laughs> That's outstanding. I even saw, there's such a cute picture of a dog that's wearing a necklace made out of a papel, um, papel um, picado. That's so cute. And you know, is that your little white dog? Your little white chihuahua? Is it something? It's so cute. Aww. That it. was a little stray puppy Aww. that uh, she's a little snow white stray puppy. And I found her um, when I was going to work one day, I was walking up to the studio and she was crying and I. Who she belonged to. And it was, it was like, I had just discovered Instagram <clears throat> So I was posting progress of like me trying to find a home for this dog. And um, meanwhile, I was just really, really attached to her. She was so sweet. But where I lived at the time, I couldn't have pets. So I took these really like, like beauty shots of her with the Papa Picado necklace. (laughs) 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 And um, within a couple of days, I had one of my followers uh, reach out and say, Hey, we want to adopt a dog. And, she came down to NDO where my studio is and we met at a park and I introduced her to the puppy and she took her home. And now the doggy didn't need her Paloma. She lives with her parents. And um, yeah, that was a, that was a good story. That's a really was, good story. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I wish I could have kept her, but I just couldn't at the time. It's a really sweet story, though. You, you found a dog, a new home. That's wonderful. With your art, <laughs> that's outstanding. So tell me, what's the most exciting piece you've ever made? When you think about all the stuff that you've done in the last 10 years. Uh, um, early on, and I know that this isn't like typical business savviness, but I was really a super strong Obama supporter um, during his first campaign. And so one of the first patterns I drew by hand was it said Viva Obama. And I did uh, banners in his um, campaign colors and um, sold a ton of them. It was really exciting for me when um, his main campaign Facebook page featured a picture of somebody who had bought, like, of the, of the banners that I made wow. in his Washington, D.C. campaign headquarters. Like, somebody had found them and bought them and hung them at the campaign headquarters. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, that was really exciting. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, I would be so excited. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, I was. I was thrilled. I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that. Um, let's see. Recently, last year, we did um, Hollywood's Day of the Dead uh, Festival, Hollywood Forever Cemeteries event. And I'd never been. So for me, it was very excited to go. So, um, I got to work with Netflix. They commissioned a bunch of um, custom banners for what they were doing was they were making altars for characters in their Netflix TV shows that had passed away. And, you know, it's always iffy when you introduce commercializing an event like that. But I respected that they were reaching out to actual artisans in the community. I mean, they had me doing the Papel Picado. They had um, <clears throat> local filmmakers there in L.A., like, documenting the, the altar process. They had brought up... Um, artisans from Mexico to actually assemble the altars in a respectful way. And I was like, well, you know, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And that was really exciting because I got to go up there and work with them on site during the day they were setting up the altars. And there were like five or six of them. Um, and that was, that was pretty exciting to be there. i would never been to that event before. It's really cool to get a chance to check it out. Okay, well, that sounds very fun and very exciting. So I know that you sell your pieces in different sizes. So can you share that with our listeners, like the sizes that you make? Is it by the foot? Is it by the inch? Um, gosh, we do so many things. We have a, a line of ready-made papel picado that I have designed to be like altar size, like home altar size. They're about four feet wide um, that are ready to make, I mean, ready to order and they ship within a couple of days. Um, my cousin Lydia works with us now. So it's me, my brother Stevan, uh, my cousin Lydia. And during the summers, my daughter Bea works with us too, but she's back at college now. <clears throat> so um, we've got ready-made like altar size banners you can go and get. And um, people use them, like, in their office cubicles. They use them, like, in uh, teaching tools in classrooms. I've had libraries buy them for their, like, Day of the Dead book displays. Um, They're just really easy. They go anywhere. And then we have um, uh, custom stuff, semi-custom stuff, like, where you can put in your personalized wording and um, you can order in your custom colors. And uh, we have that. We also offer, like, big event um, stuff. So, for instance, we give bulk pricing for, like, events where you need 200 feet or more of Papel Picado. Um, We also do tiny, tiny, tiny cake toppers with the tiniest Papel Picado flags I've ever seen. (laughs) Um, And those I made just, like, as a lark. Like, I was... I was really frustrated because I would cut my big flags and then there was like extra paper that was a, like in the border of my design that wasn't being used. And I started to wonder, I was like, I don't like wasting this material, you know? Yeah. It went in the recycle bin, but I don't care. I just wanted to see if I could use it. And so I started to make miniature 
miniatures. So we do miniature banners where the flags are like half an inch wide or an inch wide. <clears throat> and those have really taken off. So, so yeah, we really have like a huge <laughs> variety of what, what we make. Now it's at your Etsy store. So can you tell our listeners how they would find you and how they could order your products online? Um, we have our original Etsy store. Um, I think it's, uh, well, it's under I'm Ahead. And um, you can find us there. Uh, we have a main website. It's imoheadshop.com. And um, that also has a link to the, web, to the Etsy site if you prefer that. Um, if you go to our main website, imoheadshop.com, I have a little form you can fill out and send to me directly with, if you have like a special request or just like a question about anything. And um, that comes directly to my email. Um, we have a phone number on the website that you can call that comes to myself. Um, it also works for text. So if you just want to shoot me a quick text and you have a question, you know, usually I'm, I'm available to answer. I answer as soon as I can. Yeah. We're, we're, that's how you can find us, mainly on Etsy and on the main site with all the links there. We're on Instagram. Well, that's mainly, it's like a mix between me telling my story of our experience of the shop. And the Instagram handle is imohead, one word. So those are mainly like what we use. So that's great. So pretty much anybody anywhere can get your stuff, which is outstanding. <laughs> you ship. So that's lovely. So I wanted to ask you, um, what's the biggest piece you've ever made? Like that's taking you the longest amount of time. <sighs> that's hard. You know, honestly, the shop keeps me, has kept me so busy. I mean, it's not like I sit around with my head in the clouds all day, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, there's, there's a lot of work that goes into making it happen and keeping it running and bringing the orders in and making sure right. things ship on time and ordering supplies and all that. Uh, I feel like I've barely begun to tap into what I see in my head. Okay. So I'm, I'm getting there. I think probably the thing that, recently that was the biggest effort was um we did a Cinco de Mayo um like art display or exhibit type of thing um installation at the local senior center and it was a collaborative effort with my mom and my daughter and myself and it took weeks to put it together and um, it was only up for about a month, but I was so proud. It was really exciting to be able to put something together with my family and, you know, three generations of us. And my grandma went to that senior center. So it was, that to me was more, was big. That's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So I want to, uh, for our listeners who aren't in the chat room and not Latino, I'm ahead is spelled A Y. M-U-J-E-R. And you can start using it because it, you know, I'm ahead is kind of fun to say. <laughs> it's like, and the way I use it is, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> so, no way. Yeah, I kind of like that. <laughs> yeah. I'm ahead. What are you talking about? <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to, to share that with our listeners. Um, thank, you. But, thank you. But it's such a lovely when I asked the question about the biggest, and I know you've done stuff for Target and Netflix and for some other really big brands like Don Julio, and you talk about the senior center where your grandma's gone to and that you did with your mom and your daughter, and it shows that you're not only an amazing artist, it shows that you have an amazing heart. So that's fantastic. Elena, that's really, uh -huh. really wonderful. So, um, you know, you, you started a business, you're a business owner, a growing business. Can you talk to us about some of the challenges that you faced as far as being a business owner? Uh, sure. Um, let's see. 
Oh, so many. Like, you, you know, my background is in art school, so I didn't get much business training at all. My, my dad's self-employed. He, he's a psychologist, so I was able to get some business tips from him early on. But um, it's a totally different business. <clears throat> so, um, for instance, when I registered for a business license, and I did this a couple of years after the shop had been going, but I didn't know I needed it before. So when I registered, um, I was like, do I need to collect sales tax? And the person in the office said, no, because you're selling on the internet. And I asked my accountant and he said, no, because you're selling on the internet. Granted, he was about 75, but I just took his (laughs) word for it. Um, The next year I found out I owed like an entire back year in in sales tax. That was really difficult. But, uh, you know, I mean, I happened to be in a place where selling on the internet was so new at the time that no, uh, nobody really quite knew how to handle it. So that was a challenge. Um, I think things are much different now. Um, for instance, uh, when I first started selling on Etsy and that was our main sales point, um, I didn't have much competition. Slowly over time, we, we have a lot more competition. Like there are people literally copying and pasting pieces of my website to make building theirs easier. And that was challenging to like not get discouraged and to move forward and always try to do better and not get sad about it. You know, sometimes I would vent. Luckily I've always had a big support system and I would definitely vent about it. And then I would just like move forward. Um, Let's see, a few years ago, the competition on um, online got so fierce for the wedding category that I was like, okay, what can I do? Because I have a winter to get through, and winter is generally the lowest or the slowest season for Papel Picado. Because, I mean, if you think about it, like the rest, the rest of the country, other than Southern California, they have seasons. Yeah, right. paper paper is not going to work for them. No, and so, not. like, while I may be perfectly happy and willing to make it, it's not going to work for your wedding like, anywhere else in the country at that time. So I was like, okay, well, what can I do? And I was like, well, what, what about Australia? Um, their seasons are reversed. It's summer down there. And so I ran a bunch of online promotions to sell to Australia and New Zealand, and it got us through a really hard winter. And I was like, so grateful that, again, you know, you just don't get boxed in. You don't feel discouraged. You just figure, like, what can I do? What can I do? <clears throat> um, after that, the postal rates changed, and that wasn't, like, quite as um, a short thing as it was before. So, you know, you just got to keep adapting and evolving. But those are the kind of changes that come up when you're when you're on your own and doing your own business. Like, you have to figure it out for yourself. There's no set book. Yeah, the whole um, piece where people steal part of your website, that is such a big problem in many bis- different types of businesses. I know my day mm-hmm. job experienced that, too. And it's really disheartening. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, usually at that point, I just dig in and I'm like, well, what makes us different? And then I make something very personal to myself and I figure out that it actually resonates with tons of other people out there. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I've never, I haven't been discouraged yet from doing that. It just, it makes me feel better if anything else. Well, I was looking at your artwork and going, hmm, where can Molly Mama use this? Sometime in the future, I'm sure I'm going to be contacting you for something custom because my, my little brain has been going because I'm working on a new cookbook. And I was like, oh, so. Um, yes. <laughs> so what have some of the rewards been of being a business owner and especially supporting yourself through art, which I think is a magical thing. Um, one, one of my biggest rewards has been being able to provide work for my family. Mm. Like I, I, it started out with me wanting to support my 
daughter, you know, as a single parent. She was about in the third or fourth grade when I started the shop and um, got her all the way through high school. She worked in the shop her sophomore, junior, senior year, and now this summer, her first year of college during the summer. And she's been able to, you know, earn some money, um, have a flexible schedule. And I was able to be there for her when she was little and going through all of her school performances and stuff. That, that's been, that was always my first goal. And, and I'm so grateful that we were able to do that, like achieve it. Um, my brother worked for the shop full time and then he's gone back to college part time in the last two, three years. So it was amazing to be able to see my family every day and interact and work together and provide um, money for that. My cousin Lydia, um, she and I weren't very close, but she reached out to me one day. I was on Instagram expressing that I felt like I was really stressed out, like I had a little bit too much work. And she reached out and she's like, I can help. And I asked her over to my house to teach her and she loved it. And not only that, she was very good at it. And also she loved like the thought and the heart behind the work. Like it meant a lot to her, you know, and, and she has a little daughter that was about the same age that it, my daughter was when we started the shop. And now her daughter's learning how to string it. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, how can I, uh, to me, that's, that's the most rewarding part of it. So you've been able to take your talent and use it to not only support yourself, but your family members and work together. It's, that is so beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. It's a great story. You know, we have um, several people in the chat room just commenting about how beautiful your work is and just a lot of wows. And that's amazing. So I just wanted to share that with you because we're, our producer, our day is posting pictures in there of your work and people are looking at your Instagram account and it's just, it is, it truly is art and it, it is happiness. <laughs> and the fact that you have been able to use your talents, like I said earlier, and have your family prosper and work together is just, it's great. Um, I, I love it. It's just a beautiful story. I'm so glad Alicia Delicious introduced me to you. So it's very <laughs> I wanted to um, switch channels for you for just a moment because I am so into food. And I think I read that your father started your local tamale festival. Is that oh, true? my grandpa? That was your grandpa. Okay. Your grandpa started yeah. local tamale festival. Okay. So if your grandpa started a tamale festival, are you a huge tamale fan? Who isn't? <laughs> okay. I'm like, who's yeah. so smart? <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, he, um, we were from a small, uh, a small, a small town, um, called Indio in Southern California. It's about 20 minutes out of Palm Springs. And the motto of the town is the city of festivals. And, um, my, my grandpa and his, gosh, I don't remember how old he was. I just remember his hair was all white. But he tried making the world's longest tamale. <laughs> like he had Guinness Book world records out to visit and everything. And he designed this custom steamer and had his guys make it. And he didn't quite make the world's longest tamale. But out of that effort, he, he thought we should do a tamale festival like with the community. And everybody would make their best recipe and then we'll judge it and give out trophies and people can sell things and yeah it's taken off it's become like this huge huge event for us for the press as a town and also like in the world of the Manus. when is it because i have to try to come i'm serious i'm so oh. serious oh my gosh you're catching me off guard i don't know right now where it is this year it's indio international tamale festival Okay, I, I, I will look it up. I'll look it up and find I'll send it. you a picture of <laughs> okay. him um, uh, practicing on one of his preliminary steamers. <laughs> How long was this tamale that he made? 
Oh, gosh, I was in middle school when he made it. So I was like a self-centered, snarky teenager. But <laughs> I'll ask my mom. <laughs> um, it's December 1st and 2nd this year. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm going to try to come. That sounds amazing. <laughs> Why we don't have that in Northern California. <laughs> like, we're, we're missing out, clearly. The Tamale Festival is a great <laughs> idea. So if, you're, if your town is the town of festivals, what other festivals do you have there? Um, the other big one is the Riverside County Date Festival. So our, our valley is like the the seat of the date history in, in the, the country. And so um, we, we have the biggest date festival out here. <laughs> I, I grew up eating dates. I don't know if a lot of people have, but for me, it's always been really natural. We have tons of palm trees out here. It's just like a really historically rural area. So one of my husband's favorite things on the planet is bacon wrapped dates. So, oh yeah, yes. So, so we eat dates, but usually there's a little bacon <laughs> that's involved with them. Yeah, yeah, they're they're really good. They're delicious. Wow. Okay, Tamale Festival. I'm super excited. Okay, get back to your um, papel picado. Do you do you have anything else exciting working on or that's coming up? I know Dia de los Muertos is coming up. So is that a really busy time for you? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's really busy. Um, for now, what I have are, um, a bunch of inquiries that I've been working with, like privately through email of different event promoters or event producers or, I mean, that's part of like being, um, doing this kind of work. Like some of it sells directly to the website and then some of it is what I call pipeline work, which is where you like and then query through your email and you follow through and you follow through and then eventually some of them pan out and some of them don't. So I've got that in the process with different events and different you know, event promoters or brand promoters. Um, the one thing I do have on the calendar is that I'm going to do the North Park Day of the Dead Festival um, in San Diego on, I think that's October 27th. So, and, and I never vend in person, so I'm really, like, reaching out and doing something new with this because I'd like to meet our customers, our buyers, our people, people who have been following us for a while. And um, now that I have Lydia working with us, she's working really hard to make enough inventory so that we'll be all set and ready to go in person and have, like, lots of options and lots of fun stuff for people to be able to grow on the go. That is really exciting. So in your home, do you have your items hanging up or are they pretty much in your studio or I think they're so cheerful. I have them everywhere. So I definitely the studio is full of stuff. Um, Trying to look at the date for the North Park thing. I think that's October 27th. Okay. Um, Let's see. Yeah, no, I have Papa Picado up at the shop for practically every corner is full of it. Okay. Part of what I like looking at, though, is, like, the way the paper fades with time. I mean, part of the magic of Papa Picado is that it's not supposed to last forever. Like, when you use it on an altar or your ofrenda for Dia de los Muertos, it represents the breath of life. So it comes and it goes and, you know, as the papel picada moves in the air, it's sort of like this beautiful example of the breath of life. Like it's very fragile. And so, um, I like hanging it up at the shop and then I have stuff, I have banners that have been hanging there for like five, six years. And I just, every once in a while when I pass by it, I'll look at it and I'll notice the, that the paper's faded or that it, it's just, the colors are muted but it's still beautiful. And, um, yeah, I, I have new stuff and old stuff and I watch the papers change and, but I like I like acknowledging that it isn't supposed to last forever. You know, nothing does. 
Nothing lasts forever. I love what you said about, I, I did not know that that's what it represented for Dia de los Muertos, for the altars. I had no idea. That is so mm-hmm. beautiful. Okay, I just, I have so many ideas of how I want to collaborate and do something for Molly Mama. So I have to, I'm, I'm trying to still interview you, but I'm like, well, what about this? And what about that? <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm getting distracted. So, so I'm saying, I'm sorry. Uh, so do you have any words of wisdom for anybody that's thinking about starting a business and doing something they love? Um, I think, first of all, you don't have to make a business out of something that you love. If you want to make a business or need to make a business, obviously you should pick something that you're good at or that you're well equipped to handle or that you feel up to the challenge to take on. Um, But if you have something you love, you don't have to make it into a business. I think some people think that you have to do that in order for it to be successful, but no, I don't think so. If, if it is in your calling and you want to make a business out of it, there's so many ways to start a business. I would suggest reaching out to your mentors, um, looking for people that can have the time to give you advice. And don't take it to heart if you reach out to somebody and they don't answer you. Like, it's really, really hard to run your own business. It's super time consuming. But, um, like, one of the things I did early on when my shop started to take off and I felt overwhelmed and I had literally, like, no mentors to reach out to is I looked at other shops um, online that I admired and I was like I and I reached out to some and then they never answered <clears throat> and then I got lucky and and one of the shops that um, I was looking out to as that I had admired started to offer consulting services so I hired them and they were the ones that really helped me like to scale you know, reasonably, and and to to, to make a full, uh, plan for the future. So um, there's always options out there. There's people you can reach out to, or you, there's resources. I would suggest doing that. I mean, getting a, a consultant early on, like a consultant that was basically where I'm at the level that I'm in now, was really important. That was really wonderful advice, and I love what you said about it doesn't have to be a business and basically giving yourself permission to do what you love. Um, mm-hmm. That's a beautiful thing. You know, I can't believe that we are pretty much out of time, <laughs> that it's, our time together has gone so quickly, Irena. For me, it has been such an honor to speak to you. You are a talented artist with a great heart. And I just am so excited about what we're going to continue to see from you and what you're going to be making in the future. And, you know, my one last question for you is, is there, is there anything that you're dying to make for some brand or something that you haven't done yet that you'd like to share with our listeners that you hope to do someday? I don't know about brand, but one thing I want to make is um, altar backgrounds that are like uh. accessible for home altars. So for like those of us who are setting our altars up at home, I want to. I have a vision in my head for a papel picado background that is beautiful and easy to put up for people that are busy and they can use it year after year. I, I already see it in my head. I just have to make it. Actually, I ordered the, I ordered the paper and got here yesterday. So, <laughs> so you're doing it. On that. <laughs> That's beautiful. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And like I said, our our folks in the chat room love, 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 love your work. So continued success, beautiful woman. Just, well, you know, thank you. You too. Yeah, it was lovely to chat with you. I want to thank our listeners um, for joining us tonight. And many thanks to our producer, Ade, as always, for all of his help. This week, remember to add the most important ingredient to every recipe you make, your love. And as my mama always said to me as we said our goodbyes, que Dios te bendiga, may God bless you. 
Soul to Soul with Nancy Newman is up next, so please stay tuned. Thank you for tuning in to Molly Mama Cooking with Love. Have a wonderful evening and a great weekend, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Molly Mama. Remember to add love to every recipe you make. It is your secret ingredient. Please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and check out our YouTube channel and make those yummy recipes for your loved ones and connect and have fun and enjoy. Que Dios te bendiga. May God bless you.